Pensacola class was the United States Navy's first try at a cruiser built under the terms of the Washington Naval Treaty, and also the most heavily armed cruisers the modern USN had built by a fair margin. Although immediately prior to the treaty, Congress had been willing to throw almost unlimited cash at the naval construction effort, for most of the 20th century up to that point it had been a massive struggle to get so much as an extra dime for the naval budget. As a result, the Navy had been forced to make a choice. Did they want cruisers or battleships? Because they weren't going to get the money for both. As a result, the various standard classes had been built, but their escorts consisted of a small collection of old, slow, and obsolete armoured and protected cruisers of questionable value, with the ten recent Omaha class being the only combat-capable ships able to even exceed 24 knots. With fast ocean-going destroyers and numerous fast and torpedo-armed cruisers serving in the fleets of various other major navies, this needed to change, and change quickly. With eight boilers driving four propellers, with a combined output of just under 110,000 horsepower, these ships would be capable of over 32 knots. Not quite as fast as the Omaha's, but infinitely more combat-capable. However, as with practically every treaty cruiser, the combination of 10,000 ton weight limit and 8-inch main battery immediately started throwing up problems. The United States Navy was ahead of the other major navies in the development of triple turrets, and wanted to exploit this to fit the ships with a heavier main battery than the others, who had gone with twins. This latter choice limited a four-turret ship to eight guns, unless the nation in question wanted to go through the expense and weight increase of an entire extra turret. Instead, the Pensacolas, whilst still having four turrets, were to be armed with a total of ten eight-inch guns, two twins and two triples in super-firing pairs fore and aft. But to keep speed up and displacement down, the hull narrowed rapidly and there was not the beam left to fit the heavier triple on the lower mount. As a result, a rather unusual arrangement of the twin turret being the lower turret and the triple super-firing over it was installed. The penalty to stability and displacement from the taller barbette was considered to be less than the penalty to speed and displacement from a wider hull. There was no dedicated anti-ship secondary battery, and the remaining armament consisted of four 4 inch 25 caliber anti aircraft guns, two 47 mm saluting guns, and two triple torpedo launchers, one on each side. Further weight saving efforts were made on the hull with welding as opposed to the more traditional riveting used, and a thin armour belt comparable to that found on 6-inch gunned light cruisers, which led to them initially being classified as light cruisers until 1931, when gun size became the determining factor. Two ships were built, the Pensacola and the Salt Lake City, before the Navy switched to the Northampton class. Due to the super-firing triple turrets and heavy tripod masts, the ships rolled considerably and needed modification throughout the 1930s to correct this. Both ships would receive extensive anti-aircraft refits during the war, finishing the war with extensive radar suites and additional anti-aircraft guns in the form of 28 40mm boffers guns in quad mounts and 18 20mm orlicans in twin mounts on Pensacola, and 24 quad boffers and 19 single 20mm orlicans on Salt Lake City. Both ships were part of the Pacific Fleet, but on other duties at the time of Pearl Harbor, so were able to launch straight into combat operations. Pensacola herself served initially as a carrier guard, protecting variously Lexington, Enterprise, Yorktown and Hornet through multiple actions including the battles of Coral Sea, Midway and Guadalcanal, although her subsequent involvement in the surface action at the Battle of Tassafaronga was less successful, taking a torpedo hit and only making it back due to extremely skillful damage control by her surviving crew. After repairs, she rejoined a war where the tide had decisively turned and would spend more time on shore bombardment duties than carrier escort, although this still featured quite heavily in her role. She finished the war with the obligatory magic carpet trip before being used as a target in Operation Crossroads nuclear testing, then studied and then sunk as a target in 1948. Salt Lake City had a similar early career to her sister, but after Guadalcanal, her first foray into surface combat was somewhat more successful, helping sink a number of Japanese ships at the Battle of Cape Esperance, taking three significant hits in the process. 
After repairs, the tactically inconclusive but strategically successful Battle of the Komondorsky Islands saw the ship crippled and back in dock again after having fought against significant odds. After this, she likewise resumed a career bombarding shore targets and escorting carriers before likewise being used as a target for atomic bombs and then sunk as a target in 1948. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.